Hey everybody, this little video lesson is going to cover the pre-lab procedures for lab number three. This lab is titled Dehydration of a Hydrate. This video is going to cover three different areas. First, we're going to talk about balance, storage, and usage. Next, we're going to show a quick couple pictures of the lab setup. And finally, tips for writing the conclusion of this lab report. Let's take a look at balance, storage, and usage. I'm going to zoom in on this first picture so that I can show you where the balances are stored. You're looking at a set of drawers between the right two sinks on the back side of the room. You can see one of the drawers is open. You will find the balances in these two drawers. When you open up the drawers, you'll find three balances in each drawer. Take a close look at how the balances are stored. You never stack a balance on top of another balance. Also, try not to put any of the outlet cords on top of the balances either. The goal is to try and keep the plate, which puts the mass onto the balance, clear of any unnecessary weight. And the last thing I want to talk about with balances is this. Whenever you're placing a hot object on a balance, make sure you always have this barrier, this is known as the wire gauze, between the balance plate and the hot object. Make sure to zero out the balance with the gauze on it first, so that way the mass of the gauze is included in, as a part of the zeroed out balance. Then put the warm object on top of the gauze to get an accurate mass. Next I'm going to talk about the lab setup a little bit. Let's zoom in on this picture. There are a couple things I want to point out. First of all, you got your Bunsen burner here, and it's going to be connected to gas, and it's going to be on, and it's going to be shooting out a flame. The flame is going to be coming out blue. Now, depending on how you set up your Bunsen burner, and the way that you adjust it is with this little vent down here. Now, if the vents are open, what you'll get is the nice double blue flame. That's what you want for this lab. You'll see a double blue flame, which means that there's going to be a noticeable inner blue flame and a outer blue flame. And you want the bottom of the blue flame to touch the crucible because that's going to give you the maximum amount of heat. Now if this vent down here is closed, like I mentioned, you simply need to turn it if possible and you'll notice that the airflow begins to increase and it'll draw in more oxygen from the air and the flame will change to a more intense double blue flame. A word of note about this crucible up here. Now your crucibles I'm going to give you are larger than ones you might be used to from previous chemistry classes. And they sit on this porcelain triangle. The porcelain triangle actually is a very wide. And so the crucible may be unsteady up there, so be very careful. If you notice down here in the lower right hand corner of this picture, there are two types of crucibles. There's more of a round bottom flattish one, and then this one's more of a steep sided one. And both are going to be used for this I'm going to give you two crucibles so that you can do two trials at once. While one trial is heating up, you can get the second trial ready in the other dish. And while one is cooling down for a period of time, you can get the other one up and over the flame. If your flame isn't quite reaching high enough to be touching or get maximum heat on the bottom of the crucible, what you want to do is adjust the height of the crucible over here. You unscrew this knob, turn it to the left to loosen up the knob, Scoot your ring down so that it matches the size of the flame a little bit easier. So I zoomed out a little bit and wrote down a couple of tips. As I already mentioned, you're going to use two crucibles. That's going to speed things up and allow you to do three trials before the time is up on the lab for the day. The second thing I want to point out is that if you use a crucible twice, don't assume that the mass is going to be exactly the same each time. All crucibles are made slightly different, and if you have the mass of one empty crucible, don't assume it's the same mass as the other crucible. This may seem as common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people just think that everything is exactly the same mass. That goes for the same crucible used twice. You're going to use one of these two crucibles twice. You want to take the initial mass empty separate each time because it might have a slightly different mass each time. And the last thing I want to talk about is whenever you're handling a hot crucible, you always want to make sure to first use the metal tongs the metal tongs are the ones without the rubber coating on them. The other ones are known as beaker tongs. So you want to use the metal tongs. And furthermore, you want to grip the side of the crucible by the lip. You don't want to hold it underneath the crucible. Most often, I see kids trying to set the crucible in this particular part and try and balance it. And what they do is they tend to drop it or break it. You want to 
If that was the case, you're gonna have to do the whole trial over again. But rather, grab it by the edge right here and hold on tight when moving it between the, the porcelain triangle and the balance. The last thing I'm gonna talk about are tips for writing a conclusion. The lab this time around is not very technical. You're not gonna spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out how the lab is done. You're just heating up a solid and watching for the color to change. Now the data collection is important, including all the information in your data tables and showing all your calculations. But I'm gonna give you a couple of tips on how to write a conclusion because you're gonna write a paragraph and include a couple of key points in it. The first thing that I'm gonna talk about is who is the intended audience for your results and conclusion section of your lab. The intended audience is not someone who has a scientific background. It's not your chemistry teacher or your chemistry professor. Imagine you're writing to someone who has no idea what you're talking about and you need to be very clear about drawing conclusions about things from your data. You need to be very clear about filling in the gaps in understanding so that the audience member doesn't have to continue to go back to the calculations to draw their own conclusions. The answer to the results might be in the data section in your data table, but don't assume that the reader knows where and how to go do that. You need to do it for them. And my last tip for you is to restate the meaning of your calculations. It kind of goes along with what I was just talking about with your audience not being somebody with a chemistry background. You made your calculations. You know what they mean, but the reader might not know what they mean. So if you divide something or add something or multiply something, make sure that you label all your units, but also in the results and conclusions section, make sure you restate what your calculations were intending to do. And that covers all the topics that I wanted to deal with in this small video lesson. Thanks for listening.